Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Author's Corner for the first presentation of the summer. And thanks, I should introduce myself. My name is Nate Bauer. I'm the director of the University of Alaska Press. Uh, thanks to those of you here in the room uh, for choosing to spend one of our precious summer evenings in interior Alaska with us for sharing uh, social space together, <clears throat> perhaps for the first time in quite a while. Uh, um, I wanna be clear about UAF's policy to require, continue to require masks um, for anyone indoors, uh, unless you're fully vaccinated. Uh, it seems like we have um, a large room here of fully vaccinated folks. So congrats to everyone and thank you. Um, thanks also to those of you who are tuning into live stream or the video recording um, later on from Alaska or elsewhere for your interest um, and your attention and uh, for, um, <clears throat> for braving what for us or for me anyway still counts as a pretty cutting edge and pretty large scale deployment of some remarkable uh, COVID era technology and thanks to the University of Alaska Office of Information Technology. Uh, and their personnel for making it happen. Uh, big thanks to Michelle Bartlett and Summer Sessions for acting as the hub for so many opportunities for people in Fairbanks and elsewhere to develop and enrich ourselves and our perspectives uh, throughout the year. And thanks to Derma Cole and all of our UA Press authors for agreeing to participate uh, in this reading and presentation series this summer. I hope you will make it worth their while. Uh, we will have books for sale after Dermot's talk uh, just outside, and I think he may be willing to sign a book for anyone who buys one. Um, I, <laughs> I believe uh, we will have some good time for questions at the end of Dermot's presentation, so please consider any information and details you'd like to hear more about as you listen to him tonight. We'll have um, a microphone we'll be happy to bring to you for any questions in the room. Uh, and which we'll kindly ask you to use for the benefit of those listening online. For anyone zooming in, uh, please use the Google form link on the live stream page below the video pane, um, probably on the page you're viewing right now. Um, there's a link there, I won't read it out, but you can click on it. I also hope that while you're at the summer session site, uh, you'll consult the calendar for the rest of the summer and make plans to attend any other events that interest you. Uh, we'll post the rest of the scheduled Authors Corner presentations at the conclusion of tonight's event. Um, and just so that you know, for anyone here, uh, Anne Zink is tomorrow night, not part of the Authors Corner, but part of the other uh, lecture series, Tom Bunsen Wednesday on the subject of mining history and cold steel drums uh, in the garden on Thursday. So please consider attending uh, the, for the rest of the week. Um, for, uh, I will now introduce Dermot Cole. Four decades. Dermot Cole has been the critically minded conscience of Fairbanks, Alaska. He has written and said, always from an informed, nuanced, but very straightforward position, uh, what we have needed to hear. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a testament to how thoughtful and diverse Alaska can be that this has not always been an entirely thankless role. Uh, in, 2013, when Dermot Cole was awarded the Howard Rock Tom Snap First Amendment Award by the Alaska Press Club, fellow journalist Yareth Rosen said that Dermot's prose is clean and generally respectful, but he pulls no punches. That's an important point in small population fishbowl like Alaska where we cannot hide from the subjects of our reporting when we all run the risk of getting chewed out by angry politicians or other people and where there is a lurking danger of self-censorship sort of the journalist version of regulatory capture, just to keep the peace. Dermot Cole's work continues to be remarkable, laudable, thoughtful, and brave. In, ad in addition to maintaining a vibrant and layered cur curiosity in the history and culture of Alaska and its relationship to the rest of the United States and the world, about which I believe we'll hear a good deal tonight, he operates uh, what I consider the single most important and consistently insightful chronicle of the political culture and behavior of our state at dermacole.com. 
If you aren't already subscribed to his daily newsletter, go there right now on your phone, right before you silence your device and put it away and scroll to the bottom of the page to subscribe. And then later tonight, when you get back home, go back to the site and click the button like I did to donate to support his work. I'd say every community needs a Dermot Cole, but that would suggest that Dermot's level of focus, dedication, and integrity can be replicated. And I honestly don't think that's true. Thanks to Dermot for his decades of selfless energy and hard work on behalf of our communities and our state's well being. And I hope you'll help me welcome him here tonight. It's on now, right? So we're okay. We're good, right? Well, Nate, thank you for saying those things. Some, some of which are undoubtedly true. I, you know, some, some of it, right? but you know, maybe a little bit, perhaps. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and for those of you who are, who are watching online, uh, I appreciate you uh, tuning in. Uh, I wanted to start by saying when this book was first published, I got a lot of good reviews, you know, and a few middling reviews. Uh, but my favorite review was in Car and Driver, which said that if Dermot Cole were to write about the sinking of the Titanic, he would mention every organism and every fish that the ship encountered while it was sinking. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, the author of the review thought that was a criticism, but I, that, I, I think that's not a bad idea, you know, <laughs> if you could reconstruct that. Um, I came about this, this book, um, because of my brother, actually, it was his his idea, and uh, I uh, so I can you know blame it on him. Uh, he uh, and I have to remember what I did with the clicker thing. One of the things we shared was a sort of a an ability to. Is that it? Right behind the. Is this is this it? No, that's not it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know how did I do this? Um, you gave it to me. You um, is it somewhere here? Yeah, this is, uh, Terrence and I are exactly alike, aren't we? But in this, in this regard, <laughs> oh, this is it. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, it was his idea. He said, you have to do this. This is a really great idea. This, you know, it, it'd be a great story. The New York Times sponsored it. At the time he was interested in, in uh, the early history of automobiles. And in fact, he wrote uh, quite extensively on the, uh, uh, the 1909 race across the country that preceded the uh, the uh, big uh, exposition in Seattle that dealt with Alaska and Yukon, et cetera. So anyway, he, uh, and, 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 and I, after I'd written the first chapter and then I tried to sell it, he went through and marked it all up and changed a few things and says, no, you, you have to start this way. It began in Times Square. That's how, that's how you have to start it. So anyway, so the first sentence in the book is, one he wrote, which it began in Times Square, which he, th he thought, oh yeah, people everywhere will understand that. So anyway, it was, and it was a good idea. I, I, it was a good idea. What interested him and me about this story was captured in this map. And, you know, after I saw the map, he, he, and that, that he told me that I looked it up and I, then I looked up all the New York Times coverage of it, of the race. And I knew that I had to sort of investigate this. In 1907, there was a, you know, a, a race of sorts from Peking to Paris. And that was a publicity boom for the organizations that sponsor it. And uh, a French newspaper, La Matine, and the New York Times decided to get in on the action by doing that one better by going from New York to Paris. And so, as you can see from the map, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is to go, <laughs> it's like a thousand miles to Chicago, and then, you know, then you go to Saskatchewan, you know, a couple thousand miles up to Dawson, and then, you know, pretty soon you're in uh, East Cape, and then, you know, flat of Boston. Of course, 
few things wrong here. Vladivostok is not exactly here. It's 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 a coastal town, so it's not that big. But upon seeing this map, um, and particularly this part of it, showing that all you have to do is draw a line on the map, <laughs> and that then you could tra uh, travel that that way. It it interested me for several reasons. One, you know, prominent. Uh, notion was wow what did they what was their mindset what was the psychology that they thought they could do this or that it, first of all that it was worth trying second of all that they that it was possible and and thirdly this is an expensive very expensive undertaking um and it turned out they didn't really do a lot of work researching this before announcing what was going to happen and that set the tone for the entire event um, in the mid 60s there was a movie called the great race that was sort of loosely based on this and th that movie was kind of a you know uh it was a, a far-fetched comedy but this race was also a far-fetched comedy um, <laughs> in that they were feuding competitors from beginning to end and uh, a great deal of rivalry among the, the, the teams that entered. Um, going back to the route, th this was the New York Times description of how you were gonna get to Northern Canada. So the machines will make for a pre-range point on the Canadian frontier and they will find comparatively good roads. At that time, only eight automobiles had ever crossed the American continent on their own wheels. Of the seven who tried for the speed record, one crossed in 63 days, another in 61, another first crossed in 72, and twice in, you know, it was a big, long exercise. Um, and they soon discovered that, uh, they, they were to discover it was gonna be a lot more difficult than drawing lines on these maps. And, so the, the knowledge of geography and technology was really deficient, especially for the people in New York who, and Paris, who didn't know anything about most of the United States or Canada, Alaska, or Russia. Uh, here's the head of the Automobile Club of America saying, well, uh, he doesn't really know anything about Alaska, but uh, you know, if anybody can do it, you know, brave automob automobilists can, can do it. After this contest was announced, there were all sorts of competitors made, you know, noises about, about joining the contest, including numerous American entries. At that time, the, the automobile industry was really made up of hundreds of small companies. There were no real large uh, uh, players in the industry. Uh, 1908, of course, was also the year that Henry Ford uh, invented the Model T. And um, this, with the, with the assembly line and the Model T, things would change pretty soon, but it was still a enterprise populated by small companies. So these, after after announcing that that you know yeah it's great let's let's enter it all of the american competitors dropped out probably because they began to realize that this was nuts and this <laughs> that they didn't have any chance now the the competitors from france germany and italy knew a lot less about the united states <laughs> and they <laughs> so they and they didn't have a chance to drop out because they had to, they sent their cars over in late January of 1908. And so what happened eventually was when it came to the starting line in February, 1908, there were gonna be no American entries, but there was one, one a company in Buffalo uh, the, that built the Thomas Flyer. Uh, and at the time it was a thriving, you know, sort of a higher class automobile, expensive. Um, and a driver talked the owner of the company into entering a car, the Thomas Flyer, which in later years would advertise 
well, for as long as it lasted. It went bankrupt within a few years, but it was ready for a round the world trip at any minute. That was its slogan, which it wasn't quite, it wasn't quite ready for a round the world trip or for a trip to Alaska. Now, so this was the, the New York Times view in January, 1908. This is a month before the race. And look at this subhead. If the roads continued to be as they are now reported, a trip from Valdez northward would be entirely feasible. <laughs> now, this, so the, and the, there follows a few thousand words about how this is entirely feasible, including this, this bit, which I liked. Um, it is true that probably some rough road will be met on descending the Yukon River, owing to the hummock ice, unless the season is unusually favorable and the thaw has not set in. In which case, the negotiation of the Yukon River over the ice may be impossible. And it will then be necessary to descend the river by steamboat to St. Michael and thence to Nome by the same means. Well, okay, great. All right. Um, telegraphic advices to the New York Times from Valdez, received only last week, declare the trip to be feasible. The road clear into Fairbanks, which was constructed by the US troops some time ago, has since been widened and is used constantly all winter by the stage coaches and the heavy wagons of freighters hauling supplies to Fairbanks and beyond from Valdez. Now, Part of what psychology here is interesting because the people in Alaska who were in touch with the New York Times, you know, knew that this was not, there was no chance of this working. But as, as always, newspapers are partially in the self-promotion business. So they were promoting this because it would bring business, sort of like the you know, the gas line or something like that, right? It was just, you promote it and it might, it might happen. Um, and and it is interesting to look at who promoted it as feasible and viable. One of the people who said it was really no, not gonna be a problem at all was uh, a man named Wilds Richardson, who is the Richardson Highway is named for him. And uh, among the distinctive features about Richardson were that he was 300 pounds and he, you know, had just passed his horsemanship test about the time he said, you know, this trip is fine to Fairbanks, you know, because he was very proud of this, of, of the trail, Richardson Trail. And, uh, but anyway, at the time he passed his horsemanship test, he said, yeah, this, this is a bigger joke on the horse than it is on me. I guess a reference to his weight, I think so. Uh, anyway, he, he claimed it was, it was feasible, right? And so the New York Times went ahead and repeated numerous descriptions about how the, you know, the road was gonna be okay. It's gonna be hard, but it'll be okay. Um, but I like this part. For Ferrex to Tanana, the road is not as good as between the former town and Valdez, owing to the fact that travel over it is not as great. Well, and to, to, to back up a bit, there had been no automobiles that ever, had ever gone between Valdez and Fairbanks. And, and it wouldn't happen for several more years uh, before the army did it. And then Bobby Sheldon did it. Uh, so a lot of this is just, you know, complete hot air. Um, now, the New York Times sent a representative to Alaska to check things out. And as you see, you know, men who have daily experience with the road conditions declare cars can make the trip to Nome. So, uh, and I, this, I, what I'm interesting is that the, the, the New York Times representative said that the people who are doubters, quote, know nothing of automobiles and could not understand them. <laughs> Opposed to this class are the men of, this, of the stamp, which pioneered the way in the West and later in Alaska and have made the country what it is today, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they, they went ahead. Now, of course, Noam chimed in with, yeah, certainly you can do it. And we're going to want to help. We'll help. Now, and um, so the New York Times cabled the Gnome, the, the Gnome newspaper and the response from the Gnome Nugget was to the New York Times, possible to cross. Gnome will give every assistance to autos across straight. Gasoline plentiful, Nugget. So, okay, so the, the um, Gnome Nugget said it was feasible. Uh, Roald Amundsen said it was feasible, and he didn't know anything about automobiles either, 
And he, did, he had very little knowledge of Alaska geography or of the technology at that time either. Um, and then again, finally, Casey Moran, who was identified as one of the best known miners in Alaska. Well, Casey Moran was a newspaper reporter. He wasn't a miner. He was merely a talker. And uh, so he was telling the New York Times that the trail to Fairbanks is all right, except for the ascent of Thompson's Pass and from Fairbanks to Tanana is good. From Tanana to Care, the cars must go down the broad bosom of the Yukon. The only difficulty I see about that is the possibility of tires being cut up by the ice. Well, <laughs> and, but the interesting background about Casey Moran is this. Some years earlier in Dawson, when he was a reporter in Dawson, he was the guy who discovered Noah's Ark. So. <laughs> No, the, no, uh, on the Koyukuk. Uh, so. um, the, um, this letter to the editor of the New York Times was from a guy who really knew what he was talking about, who said, uh, let us take the, let's take the, this one, this one item will prove my assertion that no auto will reach Bering Strait or within 1,000 miles of it. And this was a man named C.H. Rogers from, from New York. I believe airships will soon be common and useful. If not, we will be common and useful, if not more so than the auto. But never, never will an auto reach Bering Strait with its own power over a dog trail. And so far, Mr. Rogers is correct. That's, that's what happened. Um, well, I'm missing the top of this headline here, but after the race began in February, the, the worst road, by the way, is in New York. We're talking about New York which the New York Times said was the worst road in the United States. Well, that's not true. Uh, they had all sorts of difficulties here. Uh, and to say, believe they have conquered the greatest difficulties in the, in the East is certainly not true. It took five days to get to Buffalo. And then it was basically uh, an extended uh, difficult crossing of the United States. This was the first winter automobile trip across the United States. Uh, and it was just really bad weather in, in New York, uh, Indiana, Illinois, et cetera. Um, in addition to this Alaska part of it, and, and, and by the way, the Alaska route was still planned when the race began and when they were heading to Chicago and then to San Francisco. And in fact, when the Thomas Flyer left San Francisco, the idea was to still go to Alaska. But by then they had concluded that yes, you can't drive from Chicago to Dawson and then get on the Yukon River. So the idea was they would drive to San Francisco or Seattle, take a ship to Valdez and then drive from Valdez to, to drive from Valdez to Nome. And that was the plan as of late March, early April, 1908. The personalities of these people really interested me, and I focused a lot of, on them in this book. Uh, one guy was a, 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 a lot of them were con men, I think. And their portrayal in the newspapers were really sort of exaggerated. One guy called himself the sporting anarchist, and he refused to go along with the rules, so he, he entered the race on his own, and he began a day early because, <laughs> and, 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 and he, he's, you know, so he, he was great. Um, my favorite of these uh, characters, well, there's two of them really. One was Hans Hansen, a Norwegian soldier of fortune who, you know, claimed to have done all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, he said that uh, he hooked up a sail for the French, one of the French cars. He said he was going to sail across Siberia. That was, that was his plan. And now he didn't know how to drive, of course, but uh, they, they didn't, didn't think that was a problem. Um, I... There was a young man named uh, Antonio. Well, let me, let me, let me back up. What am, I, I'll get, I'll, I'll get to, to, to this uh, Antonio in a bit. So this was the revised route. Well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself because they, 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 they went to Valdez, unloaded the Thomas Flyer and took it to a warehouse, went a couple hundred feet and then took a, a, a horse-drawn sleigh about eight miles out of Valdez, and then that was it. They realized it was impossible, although somebody did offer to take the car apart for $10,000 and ship it to Fairbanks. <laughs> but they, they declined that opportunity. And then, so 
went back to to went back to uh, to, uh, to Valdez and then back to San Francisco. Now the New York Times, you know, had promoted this extremely he very heavily, right, over and over again about how viable it was to drive through Alaska. And the New York Times concluded that the only reason it didn't happen was they were too late. Had they been there in March, it would have been fine. Well, it's not true. It wouldn't have been fine. Uh, and they've never, they never, the newspaper never admitted that, that it was, this was a bad idea or that it was not gonna work. So in the end, this is the route that was taken, which is pretty remarkable that, that it actually happened this way. Um, but one thing the, the, um, the Alaska sojourn did was that the, the so-called rules were really thrown out. And um, the Alaska car was given an, a, a, a handicap because it was the only one that went to Alaska. So even if one of the other cars finished first, the American car would win because of this two week handicap. And I think it was two, two, uh, two weeks. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I, it's, but it was, it was a handicap. Um, they, they had a really difficult time uh, from Vladivostok uh, to Paris. Through much of Russia, they tra traveled over on the tracks of the Trans-Siberian, uh, occasionally putting the cars up on, on, on the flat cars and, and pushing them to get over uh, deep gullies. Um, and they configured the cars so they could run along the tracks at times too. So in the, in, in the end, and I, and I'm, I want to leave a time for questions here because I know a lot about this and I, I I'm, would love to have, have questions about it since I lived with this for several years. Um, I can't possibly forget it. Uh, the, the, in, in the end, the Germans finished first, but because of the allowance, the Thomas Flyer was declared the winner. The Italians finished a couple months later. And, in the, and, and what I really love about this is that all three cars claimed to have won because and because the, they all claimed rightly so that the others had cheated. <laughs> the, the Germans had cheated because they took a train in the in the lower 48. And the Italians had cheated. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how they had cheated. I think they, they took a train as well. Yeah. Um, and the the response from the the in, from the Germans was that, well, of course, Germany had won. And this allowance thing was ridiculous. They just didn't the, the Thomas Flyer didn't, didn't deserve to be declared the winner. So in Germany, the German car won. In Italy, the, Italy, the Italian car won. And in the United States and in France, the American car won. The French cars dropped out. And I forgot to mention, the lead man planning this uh, was on one of the French cars and he was a real buffoon. And, um, he, in, in Vladivostok, he had bought up all the gasoline. And because he, because his, his car had failed and was dropping out, he wanted to get a place on the American car, which really angered the, the Americans and they figured out a way around him. And, and he sort of disappeared and I could not find out what happened to him. Most of these people, I could not find out what, I, I had no idea what, where, where they ended up. Um, but we do know, uh, I, at, at the end here, I'll show you something about the, the uh, American, main, the main American driver. This is, a, this is at the start in New York, the Thomas Flyer. This is Antonio Scarfoglio, who was an the Italian, who's tw 21. And he, he wrote a book called Around the World in a Motor Car in 1909, which I, I kind of love because it is so excessively ornate. And he, on every page, he's complaining about something. He, he, he really, he complained about the people everywhere he went and about how ugly things were and how backward people were and how rude people were. For instance, this is what he's talking about in uh, Indiana. Quote, the country, this is the English translation. I don't know what the Italian is like, but this English translation. The country people whose aid we ask smilingly refuse and candidly confess that they have smoothed the way for the Thomas because it was an American car, but they cannot move even a finger to help us to overtake it. It is useless to tell them that the race does not finish at Chicago or San Francisco. Um, he said the, uh, 
he referred to these people as peasants. The, the American peasants were really against him, he said. And he was, he, was, he was 21. It's actually a pretty good book for somebody who's 21. Um, and he had a long uh, career and future in, in the Italian newspaper business. Uh, this is the French car. And that man uh, at the top is Han, Hans Hansen, who um, said he had bet $5,000 that they would finish in four months. Well, they didn't. And he, didn't, he ended up on the American car after being more or less kicked off the French car. <laughs> So here they are lined up in Times Square. And that's the German Protos. There, there are restored versions of these cars uh, in, in Italy, Germany, and the, the American car is restored in, uh, in Reno, Nevada, which is here. And uh, it, at, at what was William F. Harris Auto, Auto Collection it is now the National Auto Museum, I think it's called. Um, but anyway, this has had a lot of work done on it. It, it. I mean, it was really a piece of junk when they found it in Long Island in the 40s. Um, I want to show you something quick here, uh, the keyboard. Can you uh, uh, click on that, that video, if you can? This is from 1958, this little video. It's, it's about four minutes of I've Got a Secret. So go ahead and make it full screen too. No, right there, right there is good. It's too long otherwise. Yeah, just go ahead and play. Turn it off. It's, I've got a secret. Nope. Nope, nobody could guess. This, this is the American driver. He was 85 years old then. That, that's what it looked like before William Harrow bought it and restored it. It, it was in a, a museum in Long Island. Thank you. 
I, I mean, I really like the idea that they, he got a, gets a carton of Winston's and, and the money. Anyway, you could turn that off. Yeah. So I think everybody had to smoke on the, who's on, on the show. Um, so in the end, I don't know what this event, I don't know if there's any lasting significance to this, this event. That's another YouTube thing that you can probably turn off there. That's, it's an enzyme called something. All right, anyway, I don't know if there's any lasting significance to it, but to me, it is really interesting. And I, I think an entire book on the Alaska angle would be interesting. I don't know if anybody would read it, but to me it would be interesting because the, it, this, it just showed the gap between the knowledge of what needed to happen to make this, you know, to, 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 to undertake something like this and the total ignorance about the, the country they were facing. And that's not even talking about Russia. I mean, which would be a lot worse because a lot longer. Anyway, uh, we have some time for, for questions. I, I want to stop now and, and uh, oh, let me, let me just I'll close with one more thing. A lot of the, there were many, many new publications at that time about automobiles, both in the United States and in Europe. Most of them derided this whole concept as a joke. And here's the horseless age right after the race began saying, we wish to commend the American manufacturers for having, with one exception, refrained from participation in the so-called New York to Paris race as we advise in these columns. Uh, anyway, they did not think that this, you know, newspaper publicity stunt, which is mainly what it was, uh, uh, deserved uh, to, uh, to go forward. Uh, anyway, uh, but I got a book out of it. So that was, that was good. So, anyway, thank you very much. And I, we, if, if there's any questions, um, then uh, yes. Well, well, they, because there, there was no, they did know there was no chance of doing it in the summer in Alaska or in Northern Russia. So they were correct about that. I mean, you, you could, I mean, the, the only hope was to do it on the snow. And, you know, and if, if, a, if, one miracle after another had happened, you could probably do it, but <laughs> I mean, so, so my, but, but that's why. And um, uh, they'd have an easier time in the, in the lower 48 and in Europe, certainly. But the Thomas Flyer ended up and the, the German Protos ended up finishing in uh, mid to late July. So they left New York on February 12th, I think it was, and finished in July, so. And all three won, of course. Yeah. Got any idea how many car manufacturers there were? There were hundreds. I don't know how many. I, I actually, I, I may, I'm, I probably have that mentioned in here, along with everything that hit the Titanic. But um, a whole bunch till 1934. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, um, um, I mean, there were multiple manufacturers just in Buffalo. And there were in every every major city had its own man manufacturers. So, um, yeah, hi, Jackie. Sorry, we, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I guess we need. We, the, we do uh, have a microphone, and I think it helps for people any who's tuned, who are tuned. That's out. true. Who who are listening? Fifty five. So, did they have like a sag wagon? Because there's not a lot of seats in those cars, and it was cold. So, how did and warm? Well, so how did they do that? Uh, in a couple of them, they had they used burning coals, you know, in little iron boxes, that kind of thing. They had they they were big on the on big furs, and I mean, it just sounded really. Uh, their trip to Buffalo alone was extremely difficult, and uh, one of the New York Times competitors, the, the other newspapers in New York, really made fun of this, and would refer to the racers. They put racers in quotes. And uh, 
you know, talked about how, how they, you know, they weren't really, some of them, you know, they were often making five miles an hour, 10, 10 miles an hour, you know, so. And who would do this snow plowing? I mean, would the racers do that or were there other people that were watching them? Oh. <laughs> no, there, there were not, they no. They, they, cause they often went, they tried to go on trolley tracks and things like that. So maybe a trolley had cl cl uh, uh, cleared the snow somewhat, but it was really in inefficient. And, you know, that's, I, I forget how far it is from New York to, from Manhattan to, to Buffalo, but it's a few hundred miles, I think. 400. 400 miles and then, so five days, they're making hundred miles a day. That's not much better than a, you know, a running pace, you know. Um, Yes. Other questions? Yeah. What was the prize going to be? Oh, there, there was a big, famous trophy, and uh, and not not a lot of money. Uh, it was, uh, it was to be glory. Yes, it was to be. Yeah, and you know, I mean, the the, the original dream was that this would showcase. I mean. The, the French involvement, the French at the time were still leaders in automotive technology and the Germans as well. And the United States was pretty far behind. Well, I don't know if it's far behind or not. I mean, it's just, it was d d different ideas. The, the European cars were largely more, more um, these, these were all handmade, you know, until the assembly line I think was invented in 1907. Or maybe it was 1908 with the Model T. I can't exactly re remember, but uh, but you know the Model T was the first real you know working man's vehicle. These other things were more luxurious, and you know the average people couldn't afford them. We we do have Dermot, yeah. a, a question from somebody online. Yeah. Um, this question is about some of your other books as well. Uh, so would you talk about the challenge of planning, organizing, and writing something so seemingly dear to your heart as a gold rush town or north of the future versus hard driving? Of these three works, which work are you most proud of? Which was most challenging to write and which was most fun to write? Well, they, they were all a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. I, I had a lot more energy when I was young, younger. And, <laughs> and so most of the time, yeah, as everybody does, you know, but most of the time from 1982 on, which is when my, my brother gave me my first book idea, which was a, a biography of Frank Barr, um, which is a funny, funny story about that. Arch, Archie Satterfield, who was a prominent, you know, Northwest writer had started it. And, you know, had a few chapters and uh, he, my, my brother was working for Bob Henning at the time at Alaska Northwest Publishing. Henning was the real leader in publishing Alaska books. Anyway, Archie had, in the few chapters he had written, they had gone back and forth between whether it was gonna be a biography of Frank Barr or an autobiography. And you could tell, you could tell the changing fortunes and decisions because he would change the I to we or, yeah, probably to change, change first person singular to, to third person. That, that was the big difference. And Terrence would joke for the rest of his life how that's the only difference between biography and autobiography. You say, no, he did this or I did this, you know? So anyway, but that book was really hard because I, I had a wrote, I wrote that, I worked working one day a week, uh, all day and then i worked with one my newspaper job this one was fun this this car race book was fun because uh, i was really interested in the newspaper stunt angle angle of it and uh, so that was a lot of fun i enjoyed the i don't know none of them while you're doing them did i really enjoy them that much but it's nice to finish them so i enjoyed finishing them, but all the time I was working full time, you know, so I did, I, in, in, on this book, I worked late at night. My kids were the age where that was easier. My other books, some of, oh geez, boy, I'm, I'm getting really bad at this. This book, I worked early in the morning. I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning to work at this, this book for a couple hours, then I'd go to, go to the newspaper. 
my, and on most of my other books, I work late, late at night. So, and I don't know, I'm glad I'm not doing either one of those actually now, so, but, uh, but I do have a book on Swiftwater Bill Gates that Terrence had worked on on and off for 35 years that he wanted, wants me to finish, wanted me to finish. So he, we agreed on that. And he told me I'd have to make sure to use footnotes because that's the difference between, it's not all about, <laughs> that's the difference between a book that's taken seriously and one that's not, that's what he said. So, uh, which, which is kind of true in history. It, it, it is, there's a big thing there, if you don't. So Swiftwater Bill Gates was a, a Dawson pioneer and he was in Fairbanks too, no relation to Microsoft Bill Gates, but um, he, um, he you know, had a really checkered and colorful career. And uh, uh, Terrence was interested in him for, you know, I, See, he began working on that in the early 80s. And I'm not sure why he never finished it. So he actually had a contract at one time to, to, to finish it. He actually had a book contract. He never finished, he never fulfilled the contract. And to make up for it, he, he wrote an introduction to one of my books. And, and then the, the publisher let him go, or relinquished his, the, the contract. But anyway, um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, enough time has passed that I'm kind of distant from these books. You know, I don't take it that, you know, I, I can be a little, you know, it, it's not as if it's, um, they're not near and dear to me in that sense. You know. You, re you researched the newspapers online? Yeah. And did you go to any of the places or? Oh, for this? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, we went all across the United States to wherever the car racer stopped. From, you know, we went to Buffalo and to saw the Thomas Flyer. I, I went to the museum in Long Island and went to Reno and San Francisco. When was the period that you were working? Well, I in I started on this in 1986, and then sold it in about 1990, and it was published in 91, and then just republished last year by the University of Alaska Press. And the, um, uh, for which I'm very grateful, uh, the, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun uh, do, uh, doing this. And particularly that, that part of it. And, and interestingly, I don't know if this is interesting or not, but I, to me it's interesting. My son last week actually just finished his doctorate in economics at the University of Michigan. Uh, he, he, he was, this two weeks ago, he said, oh yeah, he, he, yeah, people talk about Route 66 all the time, but what he's really interested in is the Lincoln Highway. And he didn't know that I had a very significant number of pages on the Lincoln Highway, which was the first coast to coast highway in the United States. And um, in fact, so he drove on the Lincoln Highway a couple of weeks ago from Michigan out to uh, Colorado. And I told him, well, you know, when you were one and a half years old, you, you went on the Lincoln Highway for the first time, you know, so you didn't, you don't, you don't remember that. So, uh, but anyway, he says he's returning to Michigan by Route 66. So, um, but the Lincoln Highway, uh, parts of it still remain. It's more or less parallel to Interstate 80. Uh, and it's really interesting parts of it in Iowa and Nebraska, where, where you can find many, many sections of, you know, towns that used to be on the main, the main drag there. So, um, I, I am not that interested in cars, really, right? But I am interested in this event. And, and that's what sort of got me. So when people get in, start talking about the technology, then I get lost, but, uh, you know. Did they drive most of the time on ice? Well, there, there was, there were a few. Well, what what uh, Colleen what what they uh, ended up doing was to uh, go a couple hundred feet out of on the dock in Valdez and then take the ship back to uh, the the west coast and then ship to Japan. So they, yeah, they they would never have gone. Yeah, they, yeah, they only made it in. Well, they, yeah, they never, they never made it. And then, 
So, and critics rightly said, based on these flexible rules that changed all the time, it, it is hard to say why anybody could be claimed to be the winner. Although, although in the United States, the United States, all of the accounts, including mine, say that the Thomas Flyer is the winner. You know, <laughs> because it did, it did, it, I mean, I mean, I mean, it did take this, it was the only one that come to Alaska, but, but the, the, the Germans beat them to Paris by two or three days. So, uh, the, I mean, I mean, you know, uh, but it was, I guess it was, it was sort of a, a thing about national pride, uh, you know, perhaps, but um, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting to me that the, the histories of the New York Times really don't go into much detail on this at, at all, because it's really kind of an embarrassing thing. <laughs> yes. Are aspects of this race still part of stories in Germany, France, and Italy? Well, I tried to find that out and, and I had no success in, in that. It's, it's part of stories just in the sense of the, the Italian car being a restored Italian car in a museum and the German car be, being in a museum. In France, since none of the, the French entries didn't finish, it, not, not, not so much. The Norwegian guy I told, I told you about, Four years ago, I was contacted by the Norwegian Public Broadcasting because they got interested in trying to track, trying to find out what happened to him. He basically disappeared uh, about um, a few months after the race ended, and uh, the, so the so on Nor Norwegian Public Broadcasting, they had a fairly long story on him. I think it was in 2017, basically saying that you know no one really knew if he was a uh, con man or not he just sort of uh, disappeared and that he uh, claimed to have been running a roller rink that, that was his last his last uh, you know anyway so he, he yeah i mean he 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 is very interesting uh because he, he got into big fights with the french and then with with the americans they didn't really like him the guy who covered this for the New York Times was a man named George McAdam, who is really a pretty good uh, writer. We covered much of it. And um, I met his son, who had quite a bit of material that he gave, gave to me. Um, in, uh, he, he was living in New Jersey at the time. But that, that, that was one of the real highlights of this, getting the original telegrams and, and, and cables that, that he had saved. So. Italians didn't make a movie of no, but 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 this book, this book by Antonio Scarfoglio in 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 Italian is is, I, I think I really do think it's pretty good for somebody his age. I mean, it's it is a outlandish and over the top, but it's really, it shows a lot of of uh, ingenuity. I think, you know, and um, I mean, he, he he talks about the Americans being cheesemongers and you know they're how how you know he just really he's got insults all over the place every page yeah uh this this was over 100 years ago are you aware of any attempts to recreate it or replicate it or anything yeah, like that there have been ma many ma ma many attempts um and not, none of them uh, succeeded some of them have been extremely well financed Ford financed a major expedition. They ended up flying a bunch of vehicles to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, they had tried to come up with this amphibious thing that was going to get them, get them across Bering Strait, and spent a lot of money on it. And it didn't. They didn't didn't really work. But they ended up. Uh, so so they ended up flying to Prudhoe Bay and then getting to New York. That was from London to to New York. A trip. Um, and there have been many, um, I shouldn't say many, there have been at least four or five re efforts related to motorized crossings and many more related to bicycles and boats and <coughs> people walking, you know, uh, uh, so. It's my understanding that by 1908, people had taken winter trips by bicycle from Dawson to Nome and from Valdez 
to Nome. So my question, I guess, is, is it possible that these organizers legitimately felt that if a bicycle could do it, that a car should be able to do it? Well, that's a good, good question. I don't think they knew too much about that because the, uh, in the, in, in the, and there were these sporadic bicycle, bicycle trips. In fact, uh, Terrence edited a book about that. And, um, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of national and international publicity about that in particular, about, about the bicycle um, as transportation. What they did use as their justification was, were dog teams. Oh, if dogs, dog teams can do it, cars can, can do it. That, that, that was the thinking. And um, as that letter to the editor wrote, that was, it was right, you know, a two foot, dog team trail is not going to be the same as something you can, uh, you know, drive, drive a car on, especially a cars that broke down every, you know, day, <laughs> you know, and they weren't designed to be run in the winter. So, you know, anyway, the, the infighting among these guys is really interesting. So uh, uh, they, they didn't, they had a few, they had a bunch of fights, you know, about who was cheating. You know, of course they were all cheating. Yes. Yeah. Since this trip is really uh, feasible on a bicycle, I mean, I've read all yeah. the accounts of bicycles up and down. Bicycles. Uh, did anybody ever talk about doing it on a bicycle? Oh, yes, but I don't know if anybody is actually a, a racer. A, a, I mean, oh, a, a race around the world? No, but so, solo adventurers have. Is this route a perfect route? Well, it would be if your if your timing was good and you didn't have and you had the right weather conditions, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that that book that Terrence edited is all about the the people who went from. Well, it includes people going from Valdez to Fairbanks by bike, and also people going from Dawson to Nome by bike. Which, uh, you know, I mean that that that. In fact, that, that book is going to be republished by, I think, the University of Nebraska that uh, soon. Anyway, yes, Ron. I'll think a little bit about the way newspapers would spin up stories just to get more readership. I know that yeah. they oftentimes great competition to go to the polar route to sell more papers. So they got very competitive there. And it was gone for them to get more in the air so they could follow up. Get more right. That's how frequently were the reports on this trip going in the daily paper? In, in the New York Times, there were daily stories. In fact, that there was probably nothing covered as intensely in those months in 1908 in the New York Times than this story, which was it was designed for exactly that to uh, as a promotional stunt. And this was an era when there were many newspaper stunts, uh, not so much by the New York Times, but by other, uh, but by Hearst and Pulitzer, uh, and and um, who were more so-called yellow journalism and a more more sensational. Although even even the, the Times at that at that point was given to a lot of these you know, Loch Ness monster type stories. And in fact, the the. Um, the first New York Times reporter who, who was co uh, covered this once wrote a story about a sea monster, you know, which seemed to be entirely made up. Uh, that he, that guy was named Skipper Williams. That was more accepted at the accepted as, as a sort of normal part of you know life, the, the entertainment part part of it, you know. Um, but yes, it was common, and this you know most of the other New York papers. Pretty much ignored this race, but in every town, that's a part of the work I did was to find every newspaper that I could that covered it that uh, uh, from you know all around the world. That that, that was fun, and um, the um, but yes, that that was a common part of newspaper uh, promotion at the time, and um, you know it, in this case it was rather harmless, I think, but. You know, not necessarily. You know, it wouldn't. It, it, uh, um, when when Lindbergh went to Paris, right? That that was 
at the time there were uh, people saying, comparing these two events, but not for very long, really, <laughs> because they were of a different order of, you know, the, the Lindbergh's flight was a real, a real accomplishment. Uh, this was more of a slog and, and an accomplishment too. I mean, that is a long way to go. Uh, so, yes. Last, yes. last question. Yeah. But they did in fact make it from uh, Times Square to San Francisco and from uh, yeah. Vladivostok to Paris. Yeah, yeah, which, which by itself is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, three cars did and then you know the sporting anarchist. He didn't. He didn't make it. So <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you, thank you very Thanks, much, Chairman. and yeah, um, thank you. and I'll be happy to sign books outside with you. <laughs>